tarde a todos. O Piano e Suas Perspectivas é um programa da Escola de Música e Artes Cênicas, Reitoria Digital da Universidade Federal de Goiás e Mississippi State University, com apoio da Fundação para Ciência e Tecnologia de Portugal, Centro de Estudos de Sociologia e Estética Musical da Universidade Nova de Lisboa, Centro de Estudos Brasileiros, Rádio Universitária e Rádio Brasil Central FM. Fazem parte da equipe do programa Além de Mim, Pablo Lisboa, Rosângela Yasbeck Seba e Wesley de Menezes. Nossa proposta é levar a todos os interessados assuntos relacionados à importância da arte e seu papel na sociedade. A entrevistadora de hoje será a doutora Rosângela Seba, chefe do departamento de piano da Escola de Música da Mississippi State University. The Piano and Its Perspectives is a program of the School of Music and Performing Arts Digital Department of the Federal University of Goiás and the Mississippi State University, with support from the Foundation for Science and Technology of Portugal, Center for Studies in Sociology and the Musical Aesthetics of the University of Lisbon, Center for Brazilian Studies, Radio Universitaria and Radio Brasil Central FM. Besides me, Pablo Lisboa, Rosângela Yasbeck Seba, and Wesley de Menezes are part of the program's team. Our proposal is to bring to all those interested issues related to the importance of music and its role in society. The interviewer today will be Dr. Rosângela Seba, head of the piano department of the Mississippi State University. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I have the pleasure today to have Dr. Ryan Ross. He is a musicologist and my colleague at the Department of Music at Mississippi State University. Uh, thank you for accepting the invitation, Dr. Ross. Thank you for having me. We are going to speak about um, musicology and we are going to talk about your career as a musicologist. And you started as a pianist. You started uh, with a bachelor's degree in music. Um, as a pianist, but I would like to, first of all, um, ask how you started your interest in music. Many of us start with family members and stuff like that, but some of us don't. So can you explain a little bit about your experience starting music? Well, I was very fortunate in my background to have had parents who um, understood the importance of the arts and the music in particular particularly. Um, I guess my earliest experiences in participating in music was when they took me to church and we sang hymns and uh, I got to hear the choir sing and, and, and things like that. I went to a few concerts, but I think most of all, my mother in particular uh, demanded, required that each of her kids, she had four kids, including me, I'm the oldest, that each of her kids uh, take a year of piano lessons. And this was non-negotiable. She said, I want you to have a year of piano. And then after that, if you want to quit, you can quit. If you want to continue, you can continue. If you want to learn another instrument, you can learn another instrument, even while you're doing piano or instead of piano. So when I was eight years old, that was the age she uh, finally took me to learn piano lessons. And I got started and I took to it. I mean, I, I enjoyed it. Uh, it wasn't always easy, as you know. Um, you know, when you're a kid and you're learning things and um, Sometimes uh, things don't always come naturally. Sometimes things do. Um, of all my siblings, I think I took it the farthest. Uh, one of my brothers studied piano a little bit longer than the other two siblings, and he does pretty well at it. My other brother and my sister uh, um, kind of lost interest in it, but they, they enjoy hearing me play. They enjoy hearing other people play. Uh, but they we all had to take a year of piano, so that was... Um, that was good. And I, I stuck with it. I took, I started at eight years old. This is more than 30 years ago. And I kept taking lessons until I went to college. Then I had a piano teacher, of course, for my undergraduate degree. And I stopped studying piano officially um, when I had earned my bachelor's um, in piano performance. So your pre-college experience, yeah. when you were still learning piano, uh, was your teacher interested in following a curriculum or putting you to uh, competitions, a Federation of Music Clubs, or MTNA, or something like that? Or was something very free? You learn piano, you play hymns, you play 
what was the structure of your learning as a pre-college student? Well, uh, that's that's a really good question. Um, another way I was fortunate, I think I was fortunate in very many ways, or I wouldn't be sitting here. Uh, I wouldn't have this job. I wouldn't have a career or enjoy. And one of the ways I was fortunate is in having a teacher who was just an incredible teacher, an incredible person. Uh, he's passed away now. He's, he's um, not been with us for uh, about 15 years, uh, sadly. But when I first met him at, at the age of eight, he was in his 50s. He was a, um, I'm, I'm probably giving him away by saying this, but he was a, a, a archbishop in the Orthodox Catholic Church. He could speak five languages. He was scholarly, and he was also a very good piano player. He came from the, um, you know, pianists like to, to talk about and sometimes boast about their pedigrees. He came from the Leszczytski school. Um, oh. I think his teacher's teacher's teacher or something was was this man, you know, who was uh, one of the great piano teachers of the 19th century. Well, anyway, he was very proud of that. And he told me about uh, how he learned. To answer your question, um, he instilled in his students, or at least the students he could see who were interested in the piano, he instilled in them a, a thirst for excellence and a thirst to, you know, be all you can be. He taught me very structured lessons. He would teach theory and not just piano. Uh, this was very important to him, uh, and I am so grateful that he did this. Also, he encouraged competition. I, I participated in several solo and ensemble competitions. This was up in Wisconsin. Um, he had his students sometimes uh, twice a year, at least once, but sometimes twice a year, give recitals. He would hold studio recitals at various churches throughout town. Uh, he had all the students play. He would play himself. And it was important for him that uh, students perform and that they um, have a regimented theory uh, enriched, uh, history enriched uh, experience as a piano student. And this is this is how I took lessons for a long time. Uh, and he was he was very um, he was very strict in that, you know, you could tell he was disappointed when you didn't practice. He'd give you pieces of candy if you did practice, um, you know, uh, incentive based. Uh, study, I guess you could call it. And to someone who's eight, nine, ten years old, that was a big deal. Uh, and I was always really fascinated with him. He had the best stories. He 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 was an amazing person. He, from where I'm sitting right now, he's still an amazing person to me. Uh, he did things that I probably will never do. And do you think this type of uh, environment that you you were brought up brought you to the musicology because then after you finish your bachelor's degree then you got a master's degree and a phd in musicology that's and right so do you attribute uh, attribute that to him or to your undergrad or because nowadays the reason that i'm asking this is nowadays we don't find musicologists very often and uh, we are getting less and less pianists as well. I think those two subjects are very hard nowadays to, to accomplish. So uh, what do you think brought you to the musicology? Well, I think he definitely had a hand in it. I don't think he intended to make me a musicologist, but I think it happened because of him all the same, or at least in large part because of him. Also, um, my parents uh, always stressed uh, to me that it was important to do well in school. Uh, it was important to try your best. And they didn't, uh, they didn't tolerate me getting grades below which I was capable of getting. And when I happened to do this once in a while, they, you know, I was grounded or I was, I had privileges taken away and you know what? Good for them. I'm glad they, they, they raised me this way. This is, this is very important. It's not always pleasant, but it was, it was important. And he was the same way, my piano teacher. Um, I guess, the musicology thing, I didn't really know what it was until I was about a, a, a freshman in high school. About eighth grade, seventh or eighth grade, uh, I, I kept practicing piano. I kept getting better at it. I was never a prodigy. I'm not some great performing artist today, but I have a certain amount of skill at the piano, and it has helped me. More on that later. Uh, but about seventh or eighth grade, I really, really got into piano, and I really got into especially classical music and history. I was always a really big reader. I loved books from the time I could read. Uh, my mother will tell you I was, you know, Ryan will be upstairs in his room reading a book. Now, I did have friends. I hung out with them. You know, we did we did teenage things, and it was great. Uh, 
But when I was at home, as often as not, I would be off studying a score, reading a book, or increasingly from about seventh, eighth, ninth grade, especially listening to a piece of classical music and just trying to devour the stuff as much as I could. Um, when I had when I had a spare five, ten, fifteen dollars to spend from allowance or working, I had jobs early on. I played piano at church. I'd go to one of the many stores that were still around that sold that had big classical sections. This is not this is disappearing now, kind of like what you're talking about with some of these other professions, or at least people who who do them. Um, but when I was, you know, 12, 13, 14 years old, you could walk into a Best Buy and he have a huge classical CD collection there, a, a selection. I did this. I walked into there every time I could afford it, you know, after savings and after, you know, spending money on, on gas or whatever for my car. I bought a CD. Then I did it again and again and again. And not only that, I went to the library and I got my quota of CDs, scores and books, devoured as much of them as I could, returned them came back the next week with more. I did this all throughout high school. I loved it. I couldn't get enough of it. And when I was in ninth grade, I thought, you know what? It would be nice to do something like this for a living. I love music, but I also love to read. And I also love to write. And I also love to study. I love the practice room, but I knew pretty early on that I love the library just a little bit more, just a little bit. So um, I thought, you know what? Piano is very competitive. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm good, but I'm not a great pianist and that's okay. And I thought, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to musicology because I, I, I think I can make my way in musicology and have piano help that. And so, you know, I had also other good mentors, like my uncle for a long time taught at university. And I would sit and talk to him for hours about his profession, about anything he wanted to talk about. A learned, fascinating man. He's still with us. Um, so a lot of these things sort of, there was a confluence that, that sort of met up in me in ninth grade and later. Um, that's when I understood what I wanted to do, ninth grade. But up until then, even I was I was getting more and more serious about piano, about music. I knew before I knew before I knew what musicology is that I wanted to do music, something related to music. I just wasn't sure about musicology until I reached high school. And so did, when you were reading and listening to the music, did you have somebody to discuss this? Did you have did you go back to your piano lessons and talk about it or you just kind of just absorb it and and kept it for yourself. Absolutely. Um, so this is where my piano teacher came in. The, the man who was teaching me since I was eight, I'd go back to him and he had, he had a huge collection too, of scores and books and CDs. We took lessons in his basement. He, it, was a, it was a library. I had lessons in a library and he had two pianos there so we could teach on one. And um, I'd, I'd hear something and I'd be like, have you heard this before? And he'd tell me everything he knew about it, which was way more than what I knew. And it would just inspire me, you know, it, it was great. Uh, did I talk to very many other people besides that? Yeah, um, I think it's fair to say that a lot of my friends and, and my parents and stuff, they weren't quite as geeky about it as I was, and maybe they got sick of hearing about it. But whenever I met somebody who was doing these things, I tried to talk to them about it. But for a long time, my piano teacher was almost it. I gradually met more people I had these things in common with, and and um, then you know I, I was able to have more conversational outlets. But he really he really um, made an impression on me and taught me that it's okay to be interested in these things and gave me hope that I could do something like this in the future. He, he encouraged me. He was, he was a little bit stern sometimes. He was a little bit strict about standards, but as I got older, he, he softened and he saw me more as a friend and as somebody who he should encourage and, and nurture to do this sort of thing. So t tell, tell us more about your master's degree and PhD. Um, usually when you go into those degrees, you have to have an idea of what you're going to write about. And um, I, I, I knew what I was going to be writing about. I knew that I wanted to talk about Brazilian music because there, were, there weren't many in English, anything really in depth, especially the Camargo Guarnieri. But I knew what I wanted to do. Right. Did you know what you were going to do? I thought I did. Um, I had, looking back, you know, 20, 25 years ago, uh, I had a lot to learn. Uh, <laughs> and I still have a lot to learn. Just you know, the more you know, the more you know you don't know. Well, back then, I thought that I was going to do Russian music. I loved Russian music. <laughs> I mean, this I still love Russian music. Mm -hmm. I still listen to it all the time. But back in the day, I was, I was, a, I was a Prokofiev, Shostakovich, geek, Rachmaninoff, you name it. And I thought, you know what? I want to study Russian music. Well, um, 
given my level of education, my background, my experiences, uh, I, I learned in my master's degree that it was not going to be practical for me to specialize in Russian music. There were just there was a language thing. I could have studied it, the language. True, it would have taken me a long time. I probably should have done that. Um, but for a variety of reasons, you know, travel to archives, access. Uh, I figured out that I was going to need to shift specialty, which was okay too because I listened to lots of other things besides Russian music. And about halfway through my master's degree, I figured out that. I really liked the music of Vaughn William, Ray Vaughn Williams, English composer. I really liked uh, his hymns, his choral works, his symphonies. I really liked symphonic music in general. I really liked a lot of other British music. I, I had been exploring it. Uh, I thought, okay, can I study American music? But I was a little more interested. I, lo I love American music, but I was a little more interested in the English side of things. I loved the literature for a long time, the culture, the history. And so I knew at my master's degree about halfway through that that's what I was going to do. Um, but often when people reach their master's, when they start first start graduate school in musicology, it's a little bit, especially if you're coming right out of undergraduate studies and you're young, like I was, it's a little bit of an adjustment. You really have to learn about the field. It comes with its own sort of um, characteristics, its own tendencies, its own, I don't want to say boundaries, but, but it has its own character. Um, and so I had to learn a lot about the field. And... I wasn't ready right away to start determining what I was going to specialize in. I had I had to take classes at the University of Wisconsin Madison. Are very good professors there. Um, I was able to learn through seminars and research methods a little bit more about musicology. Um, and after learning about it, I still wanted to do it, uh, which I guess is good. But yeah, when I when I first got there, I wasn't um, I, I I wasn't in a position to hone down on a specialty. Let's just put it that way. And so uh, what was your topic at, for, for your master's degree? For my master's thesis, I, uh, it's actually my first published article. Um, it really worked out for me. I had a really good mentor in University of Wisconsin, Susan Cook. I think she's still yes. there. Yeah. Um, and she, uh, she sort of mentored me and, and, you know, gave me an opportunity to turn an article or to turn a paper for one of her seminars into an article, which then, you know, they accepted as my master's thesis. It was about... Um, Constant Lambert, English composer Constant Lambert's composition for piano and, and choir and orchestra, the Rio Grande, mm -hmm. and its use of American exotic styles and the use of poetry. Looking back on it now, I would say I was I was very um, I was very fresh when I wrote that. Uh, there's still some good things in it, but it, it very much was a first effort, which is fine. I mean, everyone has first such efforts, but that's that's what my master's project was. And your PhD was uh, Vaughn Williams, is that what it was? Yeah, I, I specialize in Vaughn Williams music for my PhD studies. And this is something that's remained with me as I've matured and, and been a professional scholar. I will say that my learning and, and the learning curve continued for me into my PhD studies. There was just, um, there was just a lot that I had to learn as a researcher, as a writer, a scholar. And there's still a lot that I'm learning. I, To be honest with you, I feel like I'm only starting to reach my potential now, you know, post tenure. I mean, it, it's the, the the curve, the 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 path, the trajectory. In, in my view, is you know, looking back on it, is would have surprised me if you told me this when I was 22, 24 years old. Yeah, that 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 means that you're maturing now, and and that's what happens when we <laughs> we go into <laughs> academia. When you get in your 40s and 50s, that when you started really knowing what you're doing. Yeah. Um. Can you talk? Uh, I know that you just published a very important article, and in a very important magazine, uh, Musicology ma magazine. Can you can you tell us more about that? In in what what the article is, is about? Sure. Um. So I've got two articles coming out now, actually. Uh, the one you're talking about has, has not been released yet. It's been accepted for publication. That's in the journal of the Royal Musical Association, which is uh, one of the top journals, I think, in my field. Um, a very desirable place to, to land publications. A lot of great articles in there. I was very honored, very humbled in a way that I was able to get this article in there. And, and very happy because I feel it's the best thing I've written yet. This article that's about to appear there is on... Um, actually a different composer, Malcolm Arnold. He's a British composer, passed away uh, in 2006. And I became interested in his music, actually while I was still an undergraduate and buying CDs voraciously, like I was telling you about earlier. And I, I, uh, I bought one of his CDs, uh, the first and second symphony on Naxos. 
And I listened to these works and I thought, you know what? This stuff is not bad. This is really good music. I, I'm surprised at how much I like this stuff. And I kept listening over the years. And, and um, finally, after graduate school, I decided I wanted to do more with Malcolm Arnold. And the more I studied and more I listened, and the more I really studied with the score, I, it became clear to me as I got to know other symphonic music of the 20th century that this person has something special to contribute to 20th century music and, and British music and, and music overall. And I, I looked and saw how unfairly he was treated by critics who said that he didn't understand symphonic form or he didn't understand how to write symphonies. And I, th I thought, this is a grave injustice that still needs a little bit of correction. And so I, for this article that you're talking about, I did an analysis of his Fifth Symphony's first movement, where I argue that, sure, it doesn't follow strict sonata procedures, but it does, it does have a sort of inner consistency and works by its own rules in a way that's very innovative and brilliant and individual. And I tried to argue for this music as a sort of, uh, as being great by a kind of alternative measure. This is really what my research is about now these days uh, overall. Um, with my musicological colleagues, with many of them today, I share a, a, a dissatisfaction with aspects of how music history has been told. Um, maybe for different reasons than some of them. Now, I think Beethoven, Bach, Mozart, I still listen to these people's music constantly. I love it. They deserve all the accolades that, that, that people give them. However, I think that sometimes our worship of a very few figures can blind us to the realities that other people made important contributions, sometimes in far-reaching ways that we're not equipped to see when we place just a few figures on a pedestal. And I think Malcolm Arnold is one of these figures, particularly late in the 20th century. And um, the other article that I uh, just is coming out in Fontes Artist Musicae is about British musical, uh, sorry, British symphonic criticism and how uh, I think sometimes it misses the boat uh, along the lines of what I've been discussing. So and you touched a point where, where is something that I have also noticed through the years. Um, as you know, I teach piano literature, and yes. every every two, three, four years, I teach piano literature. More and more, I'm getting students that have no clue, no clue of the standard repertoire for yep. music, for piano. And more and more, we're getting students that have no clue about the historical part of music, and they don't relate the historical part, music history, with the world music. They, or, or world history. They may know a little bit of world music, but they have no clue about that. Right. Um, do you believe, and, and I'm, I'm opening a totally different <laughs> uh, can of worms here. Do you believe that the lack of available um, influences, because we're talking about influences in people's lives. Yes. You had your piano professor, which in a way instill you to look for higher standards and look for music. And right now we have a, a lot of our young uh, musicians with none of that. So can you speak about that? Yes, that's a very good point. Um, I think absolutely. If I hadn't had the teacher I had, the one I described earlier, if I hadn't had the parents I had, if I hadn't had the, the sort of cradle of academic performance and curiosity that I had, I wouldn't be here. I, I would be somewhere else. And if I would have tried to have been here, I wouldn't have been as equipped as if I had had these things. I've been blessed to have these circumstances. Mentorship and making an impression on young people is, is, is so much. It's, it's almost everything. Um, <coughs> beg your pardon. So, Yes, I agree with you. Um, access to people who can inspire, access to people who can educate, access to people who can instill in us values and why learning this music is important is, is a big deal. Um, and I try in my courses, I try in my classroom when I'm teaching music history and appreciation to convey a passion for whatever it is I'm teaching. Maybe it's not my favorite thing to teach on a given day. Maybe it's not something I specialize in. But I want somebody who... Um, is in a position to be influenced, to be influenced positively when I'm the one introducing it to them, right? Also, I mentioned just now that I think more people than just a handful of great composers should get credit. I firmly believe that, you know, I, I, I'm firmly against 
a, a certain contemporary tendency to um, hold resentment, <coughs> the bigger part, to hold resentment against great composers just because other composers haven't had as much limelight. I think it's important to learn your Bach, your, your Beethoven, your Mozart, your, you know, all these, all these important figures and to teach them remembering that students might be introduced to them for the first time. It might be your thousandth time teaching them, but it's somebody's first time learning about and hearing about these people. And they deserve to have an enthusiastic, positive experience um, in learning about the people who actually influenced uh, the history of music a lot. Yeah. Um, one of the things that also it, it, it drives me crazy <laughs> when I'm teaching is the lack of engagement in, in discussion. Uh, we are living in a society that everybody is very um, introspective uh, because they are more interested in their phones or their computers than engage in a discussion. They believe that by discussing something, you are against something uh, or if you if you don't agree you're against that person they, they, they take they take it personally um where do you see this going where do you see the direction of music and the direction of studying music i'm very concerned um i think technology is is wonderful and it's done a lot for us but i think in some ways it's made us it's it's deadened certain impulses and and positive things that were that were there before we had all we were our heads and our phones all the time. Um, for instance, when I teach, you know, I'm I'm constantly having to battle, sort of the, well, let's just find it on Google, or <laughs> what does Google say, or I wonder if I can Google this assignment to to an A, you know, or I wonder if I can Google my writing through college, or Google this, Google that. <laughs> Google's fine. But not everything's on the internet. Not everything's on Google. And I think we're losing our appreciation for the written word. I think we're losing appreciation for physical objects and physical uh, experiences. And I, I, I'm, I don't know where it's going to lead, but I'm kind of scared. And, and I, no I noticed what you're noticing, this sort of, um, this sort of haze that we're all in. And I'm guilty of it myself. When we're buried in our phones and buried in our computers and electronic devices, and uh, we forget what it is to get up and go to a concert and, or get up and go and, and, and hang out with real people at a concert or at, at some other event or, you know, pick up a real book with real print, pick up a real historical artifact and look at it and read it, uh, a real score, a real recording, um, a real musical instrument. And I say real, but I mean physical. And um, I think that much has been lost uh, as a result. I'm just old enough to remember the world, living in the world without the internet. I mean, I'm, I'll be 41 years old. I'll just say that I'll be 41 years old in another month and a half, two months. Um, and I, I say this to my students all the time. You guys don't remember what the world was like before the internet. It was way different. It really was. And, you know, I, I think it's one of these paradigm shifts, like, you know, the printing press comes along or, or, you know, the radio comes along. I think the internet has changed the world in, in quite a comparable way, although not always for the positive. Yeah, well, I also would like to to ask, because you, you said something, going to places and touching the books and touching, and I know you are a um, library bug. Yes. <laughs> you are constantly in the library. In fact, you are our library liaison. And mm -hmm. I'm very thankful because you have provided us with the opportunities of ordering books that we need. Um, right now, I am teaching through the Stuart Gordon, uh, the keyboard uh, literature book that he uh, he wrote, um, and it's the last edition. Uh, and that's uh, right now, the that book is six hundred dollars if wow. I want to buy it. <laughs> <laughs> that's a lot. And and recently, it, it's one of those things that recently I've I've had in some some search committees, and. Um, I get a letter of recommendation from him to one of his former students that is applying for a job or something. And then you compare that book that I'm teaching that is out of print now. And here's the man writing a letter in towards, you know, a, a student of his application. And so those kind of things excites me. And I don't, I don't see people excited about books, mm -hmm. about uh, people that know the literature. Yeah. But I know that you've 
traveled and you traveled and you've been in libraries and you've been looking for literature to write your articles, to write your book. So talk more about that and, and the necessity of going to places and, and having things in, at your hand. Well, um, I tell my students that libraries are wondrous places. <laughs> Every library is, is a special place. Every library has something that something to offer that is rich and, and worthwhile. And some libraries, you know, like the Library of Congress and the British Library and some of these big libraries are simply, in, in my mind, some of the most wondrous places on earth. Um, you, can, you can stay there your whole life and never learn all of its secrets and all the, all the terrific things it has to offer. This, this is, this is an experience for me that's, that's thrilling. Uh, and in my, um, in my view, going to a library, I, I mentioned earlier that learning things means learning how much you don't know. Going to a library not only means learning things, it, when you walk the stacks and you explore, you know, you, you might not even be looking for something in particular. You're just looking around. You, you start seeing things that you, you didn't even know existed, and then you want to learn about them. And then you start realizing that you don't even have all the years in this life to learn about them. Uh, and it, it's, it's far from an un uncomfortable experience. It, it's enriching and it's invigorating. It's exhilarating, really, for someone like me. Uh, and I, I guess when I teach my classes, I want to get that kind of um, that kind of feeling and that kind of thirst for that feeling across to my students. Maybe not all of them will be receptive to it, and that's okay. Uh, but maybe some will be. Maybe some will remember that I said something about it. Maybe uh, maybe uh, I can drop a, a new thought into their minds, and and you know they can do with it what they wish. But um, increasingly, you know, I'm of the mind that in my assignments, in my writing assignments that I give to my students, um, I think trips to the physical library are going to be more and more components of what I have to offer. I don't think it's enough just to go to Google or to JSTOR or to even the library website. I think going to a library and having the experience of finding something on the shelf and finding other things beside it, you know, that you might not even know you needed is, is something that I don't want lost in our society. Yeah, and, and you went to London. Uh, you went to England many times. Yes. Um, looking for uh, the books and the information for Vaughan Williams. And can you tell us, the, and, and, and I know that because that I think one or twice you were already at Mississippi State and uh, mm -hmm. you mentioned that to me. And I thought, oh, that, you know, I've done that when I went to Brazil and I went to the archives and but it's like you have this wonderful thing in your hand and you just want to take home, but you can't. <laughs> That's right. So would, tell us more about this experience. Well, uh, you're mentioning I was I was last there. Um, I was supposed to go in 2020, but, you know, the pandemic ruined a lot of things for a lot of us, unfortunately. Um, but I was last there researching my book uh, that came out in 2016. I, it was This was 2015. I was in the British Library. I was at the li I was at the Cambridge University Library. I was at the RCM Library, various other places, trying to uh, get sources to finish my reference book, which is basically a a list of reference annotated list of references related to Vaughn Williams. It's got over it's about almost fifteen hundred in the first edition. I want to do a second edition sometime soon that'll add even hundreds of more sources. But tell, I was, tell us a little bit more. It's a reference book of yes. Ralph Vaughan Williams. Tell us yes. a little. And it's published by what? It's what published about? by Routledge, Taylor and Francis, um, and it's uh, it's basically a, a compiled bibliography. But it, it goes through lots of different sources, in, in English and some other languages, about Ray Vaughan Williams for the researcher. It's it's for someone who wants to do research on Vaughan Williams. They can look at my book and they can find, according to various topics, things that have been written about him, which you know, for researchers is useful. Um, well, anyway, I was researching this book in 2015 and I was frantically trying to get as many sources read, annotated and, and entered into this project as possible. Uh, I remember I remember being at the Cambridge uh, University Library. I had a certain amount of hours there and, there, and, and the fire alarm went off <laughs> and I had to come outside for like, you know, 45 minutes to an hour. And I only had like three or four hours there. I thought I'm never gonna get all this work done. <laughs> And um, turns out I did get the work done, but it, it would have been nice to, to be in there for about 45 more minutes and see what else they had. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll remember that experience forever. It was cold. It was in March. Um, but yeah, uh, when, when I was at the British Library doing the same thing, uh, it, there it's a little bit different. You sort of sit down, you request books, and they bring them to you. You don't really walk the stacks as much. Um, 
But I remember one time singing a carol and, and someone was beside me and it's this big ancient looking book and it had pictures of plants in it, you know, uh, illustrated. It, it looked, it looked old. And I said to the fellow, I said, excuse me, sir, I have to ask, what is that? And I think I was looking at a Vaughn Williams manuscript and he said, oh yes. He said, I'm a chef and I'm looking for new recipes. This is a, this is a cookbook and herb book from the 1500s. And it looked like it was from the 1500s, but just that, just that experience of seeing things like that is, is something that some, someone like me at least relishes. Yeah. I think, and see, he's a chef yep. and he's looking in the past to get ideas to bring to now. And, and that, that is something that our um, students, this new generation do not have yeah. because everything is right here. You click and you've push and you find it. And those are things that they are probably going to regret later on. Yeah. Um, so I want also to talk about um, your interest for genealogy. Okay. Because I know that you you have given lectures about it and you have you even have helped me to try to find some family members and my, um, my past and families and stuff like that. How did you get that interest? Because it's very close to musicology, genealogy. Is there anything related that you could explain to us? Well, honestly, um, I really got into this in grad school. And one of the things you said to me before this interview was, do you mind talking about how do you have a work-life balance? And one of the, th one of the ways I have a work-life balance is to do things not related to music. Because if I just did music all the time, that's all I did. I'd drive myself nuts. Right. And I need I, I'm a person who needs variety and variety, I think, is healthy. Uh, you should you should not neglect your family. You should not neglect your friends. Um, but you should find things that you enjoy doing that are outside of your you know immediate professional purview. And so I really got into genealogy when someone gave me a, a, a pedigree chart saying, oh, yes, we, we've traced our side of the family to the 1500s. I thought, I wonder if I can do that. Turns out, you know, I should have slowed down and, and been more methodical, and I eventually was. But I got into it about 2010, 20, 2009, 2010. And as I learned more about genealogy, this is really funny. As I learned more about genealogy, I learned more about musicology. Yeah. Genealogy sharpened my musicology, not the other way around. It's kind of weird how that worked out. You know, sources, you have to do things in a certain systematic way. You have to be thorough. You have to be meticulous. This is something that helps with genealogy. Um, I think few people ever get to sort of a, a really intense level that way. But if you're going to do genealogy right, you're going to you're going to you're going to use sources. You're going to be meticulous. If you're going to do musicology right, you're going to do the same thing. Um, but yeah, I do this. I do this a lot on the side to unwind and to to direct my mental and intellectual energies elsewhere and to have a little bit of variety. Of course, I'm interested in other things too. You know, I like movies. I like entertainment. But um, when I want to do something researchy or booky or, or, you know, something like that, and I can't stand the thought of working more on my articles or working more on my reading, I'll just take a little break and do some genealogy for a little while and come back to my musicology with a fresh mind. Yeah. I, you also sometimes post uh, pictures in cemeteries, you yes. know, you go and visit them and take pictures. And uh, so uh, explain a little bit more about, what that influence you said you you became more methodic methodic well, in what in what what is that i'll just say without uh without perhaps um downgrading myself or exposing myself a little bit i'll just say that when i was in graduate school i had a long uh, slow learning curve things like you know and i had a professor who was really good at this um at university of illinois i hope she won't mind if i mention her name christina bashford terrific scholar, terrific teacher of scholars. And she was, she instilled in me this sort of, this, this idea, leave no stone unturned in your research. Look up every detail, be thorough. That, that, that interlibrary loan book that you don't want to interlibrary loan that's tangentially related to your project could be very important for your project. Don't neglect to, to do it, order it, look at it and follow every lead. And she was quite right. And this is something I think that genealogy encourages and teaches as well. If you're, um, if you're going to do genealogy well, you have to be thorough and you have to be uh, meticulous about setting sources and, and leaving a research trail that will support your conclusions. Um, and I think that's important for anyone studying musicology or, or, or any scholarly pursuit. Uh, the old school, uh, 
you know, traditional way of, of method and being thorough, as I said, is very important for music research. Uh, and it helped my music research in ways I didn't expect. So you were responsible when we when you came to Mississippi State to also overlook at the curriculum. And uh, we were changing some things, including that we got got out of one uh, music history class. So now the undergrad is basically a little bit more compact because yes. they ask us to reduce the amount of hours. Um, and, this, and again, it's not the university, it's um, the education above us. And as a musicologist and somebody that worked with the curriculum committee, um, what do you think is the basic curriculum for music history for an undergrad? Some, somebody that would say, I need to teach, I'm a young professor, I don't know where to start. And how can I start building my classes? How can I plan my classes mm -hmm. and the classes that are um, basic for an undergrad degree? Well, I think this is a really complicated question. Yeah. I think uh, different people are going to have different answers. I think a lot of pedagogy is very personal. Uh, uh, we talk about method. We talk about, you know, um, content. <coughs> Excuse me. But I think when it comes down to it, people like to teach what they're excited about and what they know about. Um, I'm very conscious of this because I don't like that that limits me. I think what students need to know about isn't always necessarily what I like to teach and know a lot about. And so I, I've tried very, very hard to, to keep reading and keep educating myself when it comes to different things that I, I think are important for the curriculum. Now for my, for myself personally, um, I look at my, I, I take my content very seriously. I look at what I teach, how I teach it. And I'm like, what do, according to my understanding of both music history and having a career in music these days, what is it essential? What, what is it that I believe is essential that students should know about in music history? That's how I craft my curriculum. I tend to spend a lot of time listening to music in, in the class because, and this is something I got from way back when I was a teenager. And, 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 you know, my approach to classical music was listening to a lot of music and studying a lot of score. I'm still that way. And if you look at my research, most of it is still very score centric, very music centric. I, uh, I, I'm a musicologist, but I'm not an ologist without music. Mm -hmm. That's very important to me. Uh, I don't think there is any ology without music and to be rooted in music, you know, is very important. Some people will say, well, the history of music isn't just a history of composition. That's quite right. And I try to teach how politics and history and, and culture influence decisions and what gets written and, and all these things. But I think that the history of composition is very important, particularly for students who are being trained to perform and being trained to um know things about music theory and have a certain vocabulary in those respects. So um, I, I tried to look honestly and see, okay, what are they going to be tested on for their praxis, their education exams in music history? What are they going to be tested on when they go to grad school? But more than these things, what is it, what essential people, pieces, compositions, and concepts do they need to know from Western music history? And that's how I craft my my um, curriculum. I don't do it with deference to one textbook. Sometimes I go outside the textbook because I don't agree with what's in the textbook. I think every single music history textbook, while it has its great points that I'm aware of um, available today, I think it also has its downsides. Uh, so I, 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 I sort of take a very customizable, I guess you could say, approach to my content and my courses. Yeah, and, and that's the thing that also engages students, too, you know. Um, I attended one of your classes, and uh, <laughs> one of the things that uh, really kind of I, I got interested in was because I sat in the back, and I observed you teaching, and then you were engaging the students with questions and engaging them not only about the what was happening in the world and this caused this, this caused that, but also you were talking about what are you hearing? You know, you were asking them questions about what, what are you listening? What are you hearing? Um, and then make it more sense to what they could, you know, 
find out in the score. So that's uh, that's a question, the type of question that you use. Um, so I, I learned as, as I was sitting and observing you teach, and it's always a nice thing to do. I also know that um, you practice, you still practice, and I've, I've heard you. I've heard you play the piano, and you're a very good pianist. Thank you. Um, you don't want me to say this, but you are a very good pianist. <laughs> and most of the time, you are playing music that is not uh, the so common music, right? Yeah. So, how do you get to them? How how do you look for them? That's a good question. Um, I like what you said. I appreciate what you said about being, you know, wanting students to listen. Um, another thing, before I answer that, another thing about my pedagogy is um, I think it's important to be a dynamic, excited teacher and to engage students and meet them where they're at. You know, um, I hope that my students never say that I don't have enthusiasm and I didn't try to reach them. Maybe I didn't reach them, but I tried. And, and uh, I always will try, at least as, as long as I'm able. <laughs> Now about this this repertoire and piano practicing, this this actually goes back to my undergrad. My one of my teachers, uh, undergraduate piano professors, um, said to me, "You know, you always want to play these pieces that are a little off the beaten path." You know, she didn't always let me do it. She said, "You have to have your a certain amount of you know Bach, well tempered clavier." She was quite right. You have to have your your certain amount of Beethoven sonata and you know uh, all of, all of these sorts of things. Um, but she did let me play things that I was interested in on the side, which I'm very grateful for. Sometimes she didn't always let me play them. One time I said, I didn't know any better. I said, hey, can I play the, the Scriabin Fantasy? She says, absolutely not. <laughs> That's so <laughs> difficult. And, and she was right. I, I probably couldn't have uh, hacked it that well. But uh, she did let me play things like Balakirev and yeah. Ernst Chausson and all these you know composers who are not especially famous today, but who I was really crazy about. She let me play some of those pieces. And ever since then, you know, I've thought it was, I, I've thought in my scholarship and in my, my practice and my playing, that's important to sort of uh, go sideways looking for new music to perform. I love Beethoven as much as the next person. I love Beethoven. I love Sh uh, Chopin. But there's lots of other wonderful music that has been written uh, that if we explore, I think we can, we can find some things that uh, are worth sharing and, and worth loving. And so this has always been very important to me. Um, you know, I always say I'm going to give a recital uh, sometime soon, and I want to. I'm always really busy. Uh, I don't practice like I used to. And, and that, that's, a, that's an indictment of me. It really is. I, I should practice more, and I should keep performing. Um, but I will say that I use piano all the time. Yes. I use piano in the classroom. I use piano in my scholarship. Um, when I was younger, my, my teacher that I talked about earlier said, you're going to want to make yourself more marketable. You're going to want to use your piano to help you get ahead and to help you teach and to help you, you know, grow. And he was absolutely right. When I was an undergraduate, I taught piano. When I went to grad school, I continued to accompany. I continued to teach. When I uh, was in my doctoral studies, I taught piano for a living, but I also, um, I also used it, um, you know, in various other ways to study, to, to, to help become a good pedagogue. I demonstrate things on the piano to my students. I don't just talk about sonata form. I show them sonata form. And, show, and even after I got this job, which I think my piano skills may have helped me get this job. Even after I got this job, um, I've used piano in, in various ways, continue, continuing to teach and continuing to um, accompany even. The piano has never stopped serving me. And, yeah, it, it, and that's one thing that I, I think, this is the title of our interview. The piano in its per perspective. Yes. Because it broadened your interest in musicology, but you still use that to teach musicology. Yes. All the time. Yeah. I, it, it's hard for me to teach in a classroom without a piano. So when I find that I have one on a rare occasion, I say to, to our people, I say, okay, hey, can you put me in a classroom with a piano? And on my student evaluations, my students say, well, I wasn't terribly interested. Some of my students say I wasn't terribly interested in the material. But he made it more interesting because he showed us things on the piano. I will never forget that. Yeah, the piano has, and, and I wish I could say this more often and, and every time. If I say more often, it would be every second. But piano opens doors. Yes. For any musician, for yes. any string player, musicology, theorist. I don't know how many theorists are pianists. I teach theory because I'm a pianist. <laughs> yes. Um, I will say. 
I will say too that um, if it weren't for piano, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be a musicologist. Uh, the, the, the way it taught me to visualize theory, the way it, it has um, informed so much of my thinking about music uh, is something that I could never have done without. And I'm not a professional pianist. I'm, I'm not. I use piano and I've taught piano. I guess you could say I am in that respect, but I'm not some elite performer. I'm not a piano professor, but piano has helped me get here. And so when I hear people say things, you know, on social media, like not everyone should learn piano skills. No, everyone should learn piano skills. Even people who are not pianists. This is something that is foundational. And this is something that's only going to open doors. And when I hear people say that this shouldn't be some sort of, um, you know, required skill because, you know, it hurts feelings, it's colonial or something like that. I think you're not serving, you're not serving students by saying that you're limiting them. Well, that's correct. And I agree with you. Well, and, and you just uh, answered the question that I was going to ask you is, what is the advice for a young musician and a researcher now? Because I have a lot of students that are piano majors. And then we talk about music. And then I ask them to write a paper. And then the paper, it's been, and they love doing that. <laughs> and then we go ahead and started presenting in conferences and they said, oh, I want to do more of that. So what is your advice for a young musician? I have some things I want to say here. So I'll, I'll start with repeating what I just, you know, we were talking about. Um, embrace piano skills. Even if you're not a pianist, there are certain things that everybody should do. Like, you know, learn a foreign language or at least study a foreign language or have uh, vocal proficiency. I'm not a great singer. You can probably tell by my voice. I'm not a great singer. But whoever made me sight sing and whoever made me, you know, get these vocal proficiencies, thank you. Uh, piano is one of those things that will open doors. And it might be hard. You might not like it. But few things in this life worth doing are easy. The other thing I would say is find a teacher who will make you do the hard stuff to get better. Find a teacher who will be honest with you. Not, not harsh with you, you know, not mean to you, but honest with you. And you can be honest and still be gentle at the same time. Also... Uh, you don't have to be a professional musician to enjoy music and make it part of your life. Uh, this is this is something I want to get across to a lot of people. I, I hope people continue to be professional musicians, but maybe it's not for everybody, and that's fine. The other thing is uh, work hard, but do what's best for you, your talents, your future. Don't confuse someone else's aspirations with your own. That's my best advice to anybody listening. Wow, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh what is your next project? What are you planning? Uh, what is your? I know you are constantly planning the next article or the next uh, presentation conference. What What is your next project? Yeah. So right now, um, I don't want to let the cat out of the bag too much because this will this will uh, give too much away. I'm working on another article right now on uh, Vaughn Williams' piece. It's a little bit um, it's a little bit in disagreement with some conventional wisdom. So I'll just leave it at that. Um, and I've already said too much, but in the near future, um, I'm going to be laying the groundwork for my next book, which I uh, intend to be a study of Malcolm Arnold's symphonies, how they've been received, and their uh, important place in the symphonic literature of the late 20th century. And you are going to write just about the symphonies or his music in general? Symphonies. Now, I'm, doubtless, I'm going to involve a lot of his other music and music of other people in discussing this body of work. But Malcolm Arnold's nine numbered symphonies, his brass symphony, his string symphony, his toy symphony, and maybe one or two works I'm forgetting at the moment, uh, are what's going to be the subject of the book. Do you write um, with already a magazine or a journal in mind, or you write it and then you, you send your proposal? How, how does that work for you? Well, uh, I think a lot of musicologists will tell you that you have to, when you think of your projects, you have to think also about where they would best end up. Journals have their cultures. Magazines have their cultures. They have their things they're interested in. And so when I'm thinking of a, a project, I think, okay, not only is this paper going to work, that's a separate consideration. Is the thesis going to work? Can you do the research? But also, where could this end up published? And uh, yes, so absolutely, I have, you know, a few journals in mind for when I write my things. Sometimes the journal won't accept a, a, a paper. Everybody gets rejected. Nearly everybody gets rejected uh, at some point or another. Uh, the last article that I published before the pandemic 
now I have a bunch of things coming out. You know, I have two book chapters, two articles coming out because I've been I've been busy during the pandemic. But the last article that I published before the pandemic was actually uh, published in a very good journal, Acta Musicologica. It was my it was my third attempt to publish the article. And actually, I'm glad it ended up in there instead of the ones that didn't didn't accept it in the first place. So, yeah, you have to you have to sort of be cagey and sort of be uh, entrepreneurial about your research, where it's going to end up and who's going to care about it and where you want it. And probably never give up because you probably yeah. keep just polishing, polishing until it's published, right? Well, I think you know, Rose, that um, giving up isn't for anybody in our profession. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, that is true. You, uh, if you're going to give up at the first sign of failure or at the first sign of uh, something not going the way you planned, you're, you're going to have a hard time. Yeah. Yeah. This is a profession of uh, hardcore people. Uh, we never give up. As many times that you are criticized, uh, for example, I, I've been criticized many, many, many times in, in almost every performance that I give. You know, there's always somebody say, oh, that was not good. You know, that, that. As, as a scholar, you're going to make mistakes. I hate to say it. There are, there are a few sentences in my published work. I wish I could have that back. But you know what? That's that's a lot of people. That's that's almost everybody. Uh, some major people in my field have admitted this to me, too. It, it's just you do the best you can. You move forward and you learn. That is a good advice. That's a good advice right now. At the, at the end of your statement, you learn from it and you move on. And that's one thing that you can never give up. It's just uh, you move on and you use your experience as a learning experience. Yeah. Right. Um, well, I am very thankful that you uh, you are with us in our department. Um, I do believe that um, our department is better because you are there. Thank and you. I do respect you as a musicologist and as a pianist, too, because you play really well. <laughs> Thank you. Very kind. And um, I'm thankful that also you accept this invitation to uh, be part of the interview. Thank you very much. I'm honored to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Ross, thank you very much for sharing your music career and your experience that are so important and inspiring to our students and the general public. And uh, congratulations also, Dr. Rose. Your interventions were significant and fundamental for us to know the work of Dr. Rose. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Muito obrigada pela presença. Esse é um programa da Escola de Música e Artes Cênicas com a Reitoria Digital da Universidade Federal de Goiás e a Mississippi State University. Nós temos o apoio da Fundação para Ciência e Tecnologia de Portugal, do Centro de Estudos de Sociologia e Estética Musical da Universidade Nova de Lisboa, do Centro de Estudos Brasileiros, da Rádio Universitária e Rádio Brasil Central FM. Fazem parte da equipe do programa Além de Mim, Pablo Lisboa, Rosângela Yasbeck Seba e Wesley de Menezes. Muito obrigada a todos vocês pela audiência. The Piano and Its Perspectives is a program of the School of Music and Performing Arts, Digital Department of the Federal University of Goiás and Mississippi State University with support from the Foundation for Science and Technology of Portugal, Center for the Studies in Sociology and Musical Aesthetics of the University of Lisbon, Center for Brazilian Studies, Radio Universitaria, and Radio Brasil Central FM. Besides me, Pablo Lisboa, Rosângela Yasbeck Seba, and Wesley de Menezes are part of the program's team. Thank you so much to all of you for the audience. See you next week. Thank you very much.